A very good evening and welcome to Capital Connection, where we join the dots to give you the big picture of business in Africa. I'm Arnold Sagawa. On the agenda, the fourth industrial revolution is fast becoming a buzzword. African governments are jumping onto the bandwagon, using the phrase as a miracle cure for economies suffering low growth and high unemployment. But is it that simple? Or is it the politics of distraction by governments at a loss of how to grow their own economies? On our panel discussion today, we'd look at the merits and pitfalls of the fourth industrial revolution. Over in Nigeria, we do get a report from Lagos on uh, small businesses and how they're turning mountains of waste to turn a profit. While in the commodity corner, the gaze is on, on the health of the wine industry. But first, the bad news. The price of fuel, including uh, petrol, diesel and illuminating paraffin, will rise to record-breaking levels in South Africa this week and give Africa's largest economy another unwanted blow. The, pr the oil price is uh, on the march with some predictions that the 100 US dollar barrel price will be breached in the first quarter of 2019 and then continue to rise. Now, the World Bank is predicting that by 2025, sub-Saharan African cities will produce nearly 162 million tonnes of waste annually. Our Lagos correspondent, Chris Nicole, met with the Nigerian entrepreneurs that see this as an ideal opportunity and are using waste as a raw material for their thriving businesses and filed this report. Olamide, Wale and Banke have a couple of things in common. They are young Nigerian entrepreneurs exploring opportunities within the country's waste value chains. The World Bank projects that by 2025, urban waste generation in sub-Saharan Africa will rise to 161.27 million tons per year. The report estimates that each person in sub-Saharan Africa generates an average of 0.65 kilograms of waste per day. With Nigeria's population, it naturally sits at the top of the waste generation chain. Sadly, the same cannot be said for its waste management practices, which is generally adjudged by experts as below par. Now let's attempt to put some context into it for Nigeria. The World Bank estimates that by the year 2025, the country's population would be at about over 210 million, with half of that population living in urban areas. By the same year 2025, just seven years from now actually, the World Bank estimates that total municipal solid waste per day would amount to over 100,000 tons, with an individual contributing on the average of 0.65 kilograms per day. I bought a world record which I got back to Nigeria to realize it was actually made from waste, corn husk. And that was the first thing that actually got my, you know, curious mind to start exploring and seeing the other things we can do with um, waste products, knowing that we have a lot of waste products in Nigeria. Recycling is a new industry in Nigeria, so it's an untapped industry. So when it comes to that, the possibilities and opportunities are also endless because we have a number of waste items that we can recycle. There is plastic, there are pet bottles, there is tires, which is what I do. I upcycle tires and the list is endless. We go to low-income communities primarily, educate them about why recycling is important, but we also give them an incentive to recycle. So for instance, if you give us a plastic bottle or cans, cardboard, paper, we essentially educated that those materials can be recycled into finished products and we pay them for that material to allow us to make revenues but also to reward them for this recyclable that they give us too. For this trio, recycling is one of the many methods Africa must adopt to tackle its waste challenges. As the measure opens windows for job creation while saving the environment. While Nigeria's governments at all levels have made attempts at policies targeted at encouraging proper waste management and recycling, implementation has always been a challenge, as policies are often abandoned halfway. Right now, one of the big policies that WeCyclers has been a real big proponent for is the extended producer responsibility. And what that is, is it's, it really mandates and requires a lot of the companies that manufacture and sell these recyclable materials like plastic bottles, cans, to really be responsible 
for ensuring that the material gets back to a finished product. We have bodies such as the Recyclers Association of Nigeria and um, Recycle Points and a couple of others, we cyclers, who um, encourage young entrepreneurs myself, like myself, to you know keep doing what we're doing, recycle, explore the opportunities that come with recycling and the likes. We have policies in Nigeria. The question is, do people you know work with it? We have policies favoring environment, of course. Recently, the vice president made recycling like a no tax paying sector, so you probably don't pay tax because we are part of the pioneer status. Environmentalists have continued to reel out figures backing their claims that by simply recycling and latching onto technology, Nigeria's largely undervalued waste management sector can be converted into a multi billion dollar industry. With the apparent poor implementation of government's policies standing in the way, entrepreneurs like Olamide, Wale, Banke and others still upcoming will have to continue to find their way with the hope that the government can catch up. Christy Cole, CNBC Africa. Now it is said that the alcohol industry is recession proof as people will raise a glass of their favorite triple or tipple in both good and bad times. Joining me uh, to talk more about this is uh, Tim Hutchinson, uh, the group CEO of uh, DGB, one of South Africa's largest independent distributors and producers of wines and spirits to discuss the state of the sector. Welcome, Tim. Uh, just uh, give us a sense of this recession-proof notion. Uh, is it actually a myth? Total myth, yeah. <laughs> I was always told, you know, during war, sweets and, and makeup were boomed because you wanted to keep children happy and women wanted to look good. But no, uh, it, it, I think we're in line with the rest of cons the consumer goods sector. Uh, wines and spirits are having a difficult time. You know, uh, the fact that beer for the first six months of this year mm. uh, with a company as big as uh, SAB, AB InBev, uh, are down, you know, for the first time, in volume terms, for the first time in 50 years, you know. so. The, the market is, is depressed. Uh, there are exceptions, you know, the gin category is booming. But, uh, and consumers are looking for, um, uh, for value offerings. It's, it's fascinating you actually do bring in the gin because uh, there was a report that came out uh, a few weeks ago showing that uh, South Africa is eighth globally uh, at yeah. uh, importing scotch. And, and I, I, was, I was actually taken back. How much pressure do uh, the, the, the likes of a DGB actually feel from uh, uh, imports as it is? Do you feel the pressure? Well, we do have imported brands of our own, like uh, Bombay, mm. Gin, and India, Grey Goose yeah. ourselves. But uh, no, I, I think they, uh, the good news about the premium whiskey sector is I think it, it started stimulating growth in the premium sector. And if I put my wine cap on, that's the future. You know, there's a global trend that people are drinking less but better. Mm. Um, and, and that's good news for, for people that want to make uh, produce premium brands like we do. Statistics for uh, uh, the middle class are slowly but surely, of course, expanding, uh, let alone South Africa, but the rest of sub-Saharan Africa too. Is this being reflected, at, at, at least on your side of things? Uh, and, of course, the notion here is as the, the middle class expands, uh, they move away from the traditional beers as it is and move more into the fancier stuff. Is this being reflected, at least for South Africa? Yeah, I think it is. Uh, it, it's, it's slow on the uptake. There's obviously been a phenomenal growth in, in uh, sectors with, with the affluent Santon set on the likes of, of uh, champagne, uh, of um, uh, cognac. Um, but no, I, there, there's no question people, South African consumers and African consumers, are extremely brand conscious. Uh, so people aspire and, and, uh, to aspire to premium brands. So I think for the industry it's positive. If I put my wine cap on, as a, as a category, and obviously we as an industry export over 50 million cases of, of four and a half litre cases of wine around the world. Uh, we, we are still uh, categorised as being a value offering. And yet, you know, you look at the awards that, that South Africa is getting all over the world, Janice Robinson, top journalist in the UK, you know, who's highly respected, say, no, South Africa's quality is amazing. There's a lot of great young winemakers. But we are underselling ourselves. And how does that translate to South Africa? Well, it translates to 62% of our growers are not financially viable.
uh, and in an industry that needs to transform, to create employment, to uh, stimulate growth, uh, that in itself is a challenge. So we've, uh, we've just done a huge campaign internationally with a video just uh, highlighting the, the, lack, the, lack, the fact that the industry isn't sustainable unless we can get higher price points. Mm. Um, and I'm very confident we can, but you know, the boutique guys are achieving it, but um, and, you know, we've, we, we're pushing price points and, and you know, the, the hard world of, of retailers in Europe aren't welcoming us with open arms, but I think the, the, the thinking ones are realizing that, you know, uh, we haven't got a future as the value for money, cheap and cheerful. Uh, our wines deserve far better. That was Tim Hutchinson, Group CEO for DGB. On the other side of the break, a panel discussion moderated by uh, my colleague Fifi Peters on the fourth industrial revolution and whether it will prove to be a boom for African economies after the break. Welcome back to Capital Connection. Now, a few days ago, my colleague Fifi Peters hosted a discussion on the fourth industrial revolution. Will the increasing use of uh, robotics, uh, nanotechnology and self-driving cars, among other innovations, prove a good fit for African economies? Up next. Joining me to discuss the fourth industrial revolution and whether it is a cure or a curse for Africa's ills is in Kigali Alex Ndali, the CEO of Rwanda's ICT Chamber in Pretoria, the head of African Futures and Innovation at the Institute for Security Studies, Yaki Silius, and in Lagos, the CEO of the Computer Warehouse Group, James Agade. Gentlemen, welcome. And Yaki, let me begin with you. The more and more I have uh, this conversation about the fourth industrial revolution, the more I'm convinced that this is actually something that Africa needs to embrace and something that could result in a net positive for our economies and our ills. But which side of this, the fence do you sit on here? The fourth industrial revolution clearly presents Africa with immense uh, potential. However, Africa still has to go up the industrialization manufacturing curve. Uh, Africa is at the moment uh, what is known as sort of deindustrializing. And what we need to do is use some of the new technologies within the fourth industrial revolution, digitization, ICT, 3D printing, to try and uh, do a bit of jump, uh, a bit of jump starting and a bit of leapfrogging so that we can compensate for some of our infrastructure and other deficits through the use of the technologies that are available in the fourth industrial revolution. It means that we can avoid some of the perhaps uh, difficult pathways that the rest of the world had to embark on. For example, we don't need to lay down big telephone grids or um, electricity grids. We can uh, get our electricity from renewables and, and so on and so forth. These are ways that can help Africa to go up the manufacturing curve. And the importance of manufacturing is that manufacturing changes the productive structures of African economies. Now, uh, ICT, Information, Communication and Technology, can help Africa to achieve that leapfrogging so that we can achieve a, a way to um, move African labor, uh, which is largely in informal uh, rural areas, uh, into uh, manufacturing. What is happening in Africa is that uh, labor is moving from low-end um, agricultural uh, sector into low-end services in urban areas. And this is not allowing, this is not leading to the structural transformation of African economies. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, if, if we just hold it there, uh, Alex, if you come in here, uh, Yaki's talking about uh, technology and the fourth industrial revolution, uh, presenting us an opportunity to, to leapfrog up that manufacturing uh, cycle. And uh, East Africa has been quite uh, important in showing us that this can actually happen. 
But what are your perspectives of the fourth industrial revolution and how best African economies can capitalize on it to address things like poverty, unemployment and inequality? Um, from my perspective, where I see things is that uh, what, has, what East Africa has been able to show clearly is that there is, um, there is value in digitization. And uh, talking about leapfrogging, we need to capitalize on a last mover's advantage. So we've had a first mover's advantage uh, and other second mover's and copycats and everything of that sort. Uh, but what the fourth industrial revolution and particularly digitization uh, offers Africa is that we skip uh, the leapfrogging. We skip some of the stages that were done in the first, the second, and the third industrial revolution. Uh, today, um, for the question that you ask on poverty alleviation, access to capital has been one of the, mis most, uh, the biggest constraints uh, for most Africans, uh, particularly those in rural areas. Now, with uh, mobile, with the things like mobile money, digital payments, uh, we're seeing a revolution that is coming in the capital or in the financial sector and financial inclusion for that matter, uh, where people, farmers in, uh, in rural areas can get a digital footprint, a data footprint and create new uh, credit scoring models that are now helping them to access capital that previously they could not access. Mm. And that, uh, to, to me, uh, indicates that there is a lot of value in the fourth industrial revolution and Africa has a lot of things that it can use to capitalize. So when, where previously you'd have needed to set up hundreds of thousands of uh, branches of uh, uh, financial institution branches in these places, you now just need to have a mobile phone and be able to track someone and send him the money and they, uh, and they have it right on their mobile phones. So this is where the digitization part is really uh, adding value to, to what we're doing in Africa. Adding value, but also for some destroying jobs. And uh, James, I'd like to bring you in here. The fourth industrial revolution has got the potential to advance Africa's economies in ways we have never seen. But then on the same side or the opposite side of the coin, there's a fear of what this means for our labor force. How do we balance both economic advancement and also the advancement of its people by way of jobs? Uh, I think the first thing is that the forces that are driving the fourth industrial revolution are right now outside anybody's control. They're like they're inevitable. Uh, things are turning digital. And the more of the world that we can represent in a digital format in as numbers, the more we can use computers to reason about them and also to uh, process them. That whole trend is uh, inevitable. So it's not like we are going to be able to control it. Yes, on one side, it's going to be uh, cause loss of jobs. Uh, just to take the example from uh, what Alex said earlier on, um, if you had a bank and the bank can now reach the customers on their mobile phones and therefore you don't need that many branches, it also means you don't need that many workers in the bank. It also means you don't need uh, many people to build the bank branches. So you can see the uh, effect. However, what the digital revolution, what the fourth industrial revolution also does bring is an ability to assess the information that is available around the world and to be able to use that information to deliver on your own, to, to apply to your own problems. Where before you need to send people to go all the way to US or whatever country to go and check what they're doing, you could do that with minimal investment. So now it creates, you create a separate opportunity for you to do other things. And I suspect that the loss of jobs that will be occasioned will be balanced by the new jobs that will be created. So if you consider, for instance, how much it costs to buy a, a, a lathe, lift machine or to set up a metal working machine and compare it with how much it will cost for you to set up 
uh, a 3D printing shop. Uh, I know in Lagos of, of, uh, and in, in other cities in Nigeria where you have people with 3D uh, printers who are making the small run production of uh, both metals and plastic. So the cost of setting up those big factories has come down drastically because of things like 3D printing, which creates a new opportunity for industrialization, not on the large scale that um, requires millions of dollars of investment, but in the scale that can actually be accessible to many SMEs. Sure. So in and my opinion, what is going to happen is that, yes, there will be lots of jobs, but there will be creation of new jobs using new technologies that will, uh, in the final analysis be a positive net effect. Right, but the, the, the creation of these uh, new jobs, so we're talking of uh, an, a scenario in which we've got SMMEs coming or stepping to the mark and creating these new uh, services that consumers can use and, and therefore, you know, uh, creating employment. But for SMEs to step to the mark, they need an enabling environment by way of, of policy, by way of uh, adequate infrastructure, by way of even uh, the cost and the access to data. Uh, Yaki, do you believe that Africa's economies, particularly South Africa's economies, has this enabling environment for SMMEs? Uh, to, to, to step to the mark? Uh, no, I don't. I think that uh, the role of government is hugely important and we need to create that facilitating environment to allow um, small business and the kind of small uh, manufacturing um, uh, that we've been speaking about for that to really take off. Africa doesn't only need a, a manufacturing revolution, it also needs an agricultural revolution, an infrastructure revolution, and uh, above all else, a, a governance revolution. You know, without a facilitating policy environment that allows Africa to soak in the potential advantages of uh, digit digitization and the fourth industrial revolution, Africa will not, will not grow. We've done extensive modeling to look at the long-term impact of uh, um, Africa going up the manufacturing and the fourth industrial revolution curve. And there's huge potential. It all requires a, a government that is really committed uh, to helping um, uh, facilitating business because eventually only the private sector will grow Africa. Only the private sector can create jobs and create wealth, not government, but it's government's role to regulate and to provide and to facilitate uh, that. So hugely important. Sure. And then on the flip side of that, uh, obviously, we need a, a workforce that is uh, ready to integrate into new ways of doing things and uh, efficient to these new companies and industries that will be created. So my question to uh, you, Alex, is that this, this virtual ready workforce, do we have it and whose responsibility then is it to ensure that we have the labor that these new companies will need? Um, I mean, it's a, it's a responsibility of us Africans and uh, uh, not, neither the private sector nor the public sector can do it alone, uh, but working hand in hand and creating the environments that uh, attract the, or allocate resources uh, investment into education, but the right type of uh, education, 21st century uh, kind of schools. Uh, today, uh, we have a lot of resources that are available online, uh, free of charge. Uh, if you go to uh, platforms like edX or Udemy, uh, the, the, the cost of education has gone, uh, is also going down. Uh, in Rwanda, what we've been trying to do is putting in place uh, facilities uh, to train that workforce. Uh, you probably have heard of Carnegie Mellon University, you've heard of Ames, which uh, was also in South Africa, uh, still has a campus in South Africa. Africa Leadership University. And when you look at these, um, uh, these institutions that are being set up, uh, it's literally to enable, to reinforce each other. So where the Carnegie Mellon University Africa trains uh, computer scientists and uh, uh, engineers, uh, Africa Leadership University is training them in uh, leadership skills that are, uh, that, that, that are for this age, for this generation. So 
I, I see a place for both the private sector um, but also opening up in our industries, our companies to enable these young force, these African young people to come and do internships, do apprenticeships uh, so that they get a hands-on uh, hands education rather than uh, theoretical knowledge that is being, uh, has shaped most of the, the previous generations in, in, in terms of uh, the education systems. So sure. disruption uh, is not disruption is not agnostic to uh, is is not agnostic to sector education is one of the places that are uh, that the fourth industrial revolution is also uh, disrupting and i believe that we can uh, leverage that uh, to make sure that more africans more young people are educated with 21st century skills um, today we, we have some of that in the labs that we run as the ict chamber we see the 3d printing that james was talking about uh, we see uh, young people creating new types of uh, products that previously they, they would never have dreamt or you needed a huge manufacturing plants to do to do those things Many thanks for that, Fifi. Now the fourth industrial revolution is definitely here and it cannot be ignored. It uh, looks like Africa has no choice but to adapt. And that's where we'll leave it for this edition of Capital Connection. Do join us again on Mondays and Wednesdays at 6.30 Central African time for me. Have a good night.